Take your Bibles once again and turn to Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Now, if you've been here for the last two weeks, we've gone through Matthew 21, Matthew 22. Now we're up to Matthew 23. And really, you could, you could uh, um, put these, these chapters side by side. It's basically Jesus just going head to head against his enemies. You know, just nonstop. Okay? And now that we get to Matthew 23, we get to the climax. Where, you know, in Matthew 21, he's basically telling these unsaved, Christ-rejecting Pharisees that the kingdom of God's been taken away from them and it's been given to another nation. It's been given to the spiritual nation of believers on Christ. And then when we looked at Matthew 22, we saw that the Pharisees and the, and the, and the Sadducees would send their minions to go and try to chip, uh, trip up Jesus and his words. And Jesus would come looking good. You know, answering their questions, but never speaking um, in, in a way that they can attack him or arrest him or anything like that. And he asks them a question at the end of it, and they can't answer. And the Bible says they don't ask him any more questions. And then now in Matthew 23, Jesus just unleashes on them. He basically just calls them reprobate. Okay? And this is a teaching that you don't hear very often. There are a lot of churches that teach it, but a lot of people just shy away from teaching this doctrine of reprobates. And the doctrine of reprobates is someone... All right, now, let, let me just make something very clear before I say this. When Jesus Christ came to die on the cross, he died for the sins of all mankind. Of all mankind, okay? For, for God so loved the world, okay? Everybody in the world, from Abel to the last person that would be born, you know, Jesus Christ came and died for them. But there can come a point in time where someone continually just rejects the Lord Jesus Christ, just rejects him, just hates God, Okay, God has shown the light of truth to them and they reject him completely. And what does God do when they reject him that far? Then God rejects them. God rejects them and they become reprobate. Now think about this. I mean, anybody that is cast into hell is a reprobate. Once they're cast into hell without Christ, there's no way for them to get out. They're going to be tormented forever and ever and ever in the lake of fire. They're reprobate in that sense. But there are people on this earth today that prior to being cast into hellfire, they're still walking this earth, but they're actually reprobate already. They've already been rejected by God. Okay? And one of, one, of the, one of the groups of people that are this way in our world are the homosexuals. You know, are the LGBT community. The reason they are the way they are, it's not that they've committed a sin of homosexuality and God's rejected them. It's that they were rejected by God because they rejected Him and then they've gone into, in their wickedness, in the lust of their, their own hearts, they've gone into a wicked lifestyle. Yep. This is the same thing for child molesters, for pedophiles, the same thing for serial killers. True. Those that are, you know, I'm not saying the one-off murder, but people that are just sick, you know, they, they find satisfaction. And they find meaning in life to go and just kill human beings for no reason, you know, except for their own pleasure. These people are reprobate. They're committing, like we all struggle with sin. But they're committing sins that the natural man does not want to do. Okay? The natural man does not want to be with a little child. The natural man does not want to be with a, another man. The natural man doesn't want to go around committing murder, you know, serial murder and things like that. Hey, these people are reprobate. They've been rejected by God. And what we'll see in this chapter are these Christ-rejecting Pharisees. Now Jesus says to them, you're rejected. You're rejected by God. And if you're like, come on, Pastor Kevin, is that true? You'll see as we go through this chapter, it's definitely true. Okay, we'll see by, by this chapter. Let's start off with, uh, let's look at verse number 13 first. Matthew 23, verse 13. Just the first few words there. It says, but woe unto you. The title for the sermon tonight is, woe unto you. And of course, this, this woe uh, would come upon these Christ-rejecting Pharisees. Look at verse number 1. Matthew 23, verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitudes. Remember, he's in the temple, he's teaching. There's multitudes of people there. There's saved, there's unsaved, there's Pharisees, all those kinds of things. There's the chief rulers of the temple. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' uh, sit, seat. All therefore whatsoever thou bid ye observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Now, here's the thing. The Pharisees and the scribes, they were teachers of the law. They were there as religious leaders. And Jesus says about them, they're in Moses' seat. Okay? In other words, they've got Moses' authority. Moses was a teacher. Moses was a leader. Okay? But they're not like Moses. They're not like Moses. He says, look, whatsoever, uh, therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. So what they're teaching 
is okay. The things that they're teaching in the law of God is okay. He says, yes, they're teaching okay things, the things that they're doing. Yeah, go and do it because they have the authority of Moses. I said, but then he turns around and says about them, they, uh, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. So they teach, they say, hey, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to keep this law, you need to, whatever it is, this is the way you do things in the temple, but they themselves do not do the things that they teach. In other words, these guys are just full-blown hypocrites. Full-blown hypocrites. And one thing that I, that I recognize as a pastor, and this is something very important for you guys, wh- wh- whichever pastor you put yourself under, that pastor or that teacher is in Moses' seat. Okay, And you need to make sure that the person you listen to, the person you put yourself under, is someone that says and does the Word of God. Okay, and That's something that's a reminder for me as well as your pastor, that I can't get so comfortable and just teach the Word of God without me trying to live out the Word of God as well. But does that mean that, you know, I'm perfect and I'm never going to make... No, of course, look, we're all going to make mistakes. None of us are going to be perfectly, you know, living in accordance to God's standards. We do our best, okay? And uh, just because there's something in the Bible that I need to preach, but maybe I'm lacking in, it doesn't matter. My job is to teach the entire Word of God. But of course, you know, I'm not trying to. And this is, if anyone becomes a religious leader, if anyone takes on a, a leadership role in a church, especially the pastor, you need to remember you're in Moses' seat and people are expecting you to do the things that you teach. All right. And if you don't, well, you're like these Christ-rejecting Pharisees. All right. Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Verse number four. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Man, they put all these rules and regulations on people's shoulders that they can't bear it, they can't carry it, and they won't do it themselves. I mean, that, that's, that's pretty, pretty horrible. Keep your finger there and turn to the book of Acts, please. Acts 15. Because this, is, this gets covered a little bit in the book of Acts. Acts 15. Now in Acts 15, there's an argument about, the, about salvation, about what does it mean to be saved? You know, do you have to do the works of the law? Do you need to be circumcised? All these questions came up. And this is what's addressed by Peter in Acts 15 verse 10. Acts 15 verse 10. Look, look how it's very similar to the Pharisees. It says here, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So verse 11, here we talk about salvation. And Peter says, look, it's by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 11 said, but we believe that through the grace, right? Salvation is by grace through faith. All right? And there were certain people that were putting burdens on the disciples. They were like, well, you've got to do this. You've got to keep this law. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep the holy days. You've got to keep the Sabbath days. They were going, bringing people back under the law. And these were heavy burdens to bear. Because salvation is not by the works of the law. It never has been. Look, look that verse. Look at verse number 10. It's never, it never has been. Look at this. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God? to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, look at this, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear. So even the fathers of the apostles, even the prior generations of the Old Testament, they know they weren't able to bear the law. That's why they had to, it says there, that's why they believed uh, that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that they shall be saved. Okay? You understand that? So even the Old Testament Israelites knew they couldn't be saved with the law it's too much of a burden to bear and they knew that salvation was by grace through faith okay go back to matthew 23 knowing that and seeing the similarity there okay should we strive to be lawful people should we strive to do the commands of god absolutely but what these pharisees then messed up is saying well by these laws by keeping these commandments that's your way of salvation that's how you get grace by god no the grace of god is received through faith okay now back to Matthew 23, verse, verse 5. Matthew 23, verse 5. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad the phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Do you guys know what phylacteries are? In, in modern day Judaism, I don't know if you've ever seen where the Jews put a little box on their forehead. 
a little box and then they put like this, this stuff around. Or maybe around their arm, they've got a little box in their arm and they wrap it around their arm. And then they kind of, well, that little box contains scriptures, okay? And they've taken something from the book of Deuteronomy, I believe, something that's, something about, you know, keeping the, the law of God, like, on your foreheads, in, in, in front of your eyes or something. I can't remember, I'm paraphrasing a little bit now, but they take it very literally. So they get writings of scripture and put it in a little box so they can't read it anyway, and they stick it to their heads and on their arms, and they think that that's, they're being righteous by doing that. Okay? But what Jesus says here about doing that, he says they do it to be seen of men. Okay? The Pharisees, they pretend to be holy, they pretend to be righteous to be seen of men, and they enlarge the borders of their garments. I mean, these guys are wearing dresses, these guys are wearing skirts. Okay? And this is something you'll notice with a lot of false religion. Right? How, how do the, priest, the Catholic priests dress? And they've got their long robes, they've got their dresses, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, where, where do they buy, where do they buy that kind of stuff? You know? And uh, I mean, there's so many, even the Muslims, you know, they, 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 they love to wear their long robes, their, their long dresses, and walk around like that, because they want to be seen of men. It makes them feel like they're holy, it makes them feel like they're special in the eyes of God. And look at me, I'm so righteous, because I've got my long flowing garments on. And that's why... I don't dress like that. I don't put on a skirt, right? I don't put on, well, number one, it's a woman's dress, right? It's a woman's clothing. But number two, Jesus commands us not to do it. It's funny because everything that the false religions do, it's like Jesus says, don't do it. And they, well, let's just do it. It's just, it's crazy. It's so, so unusual, you know? But anyway, verse number six, what else do they do? And love the uttermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. Okay, they love the chief seats. They love the important, prominent positions. Why? Verse number seven. And greetings in the marketplace. And so to be called of men. Rabbi, rabbi. They want to be called rabbi. Rabbi means master, you'll soon see. They want to be called master. They want to be elevated. They want to be important, like a spiritual importance. Master, rabbi, rabbi. And then verse eight. But be not ye called rabbi. For one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. Jesus says, look, you're all the same. You're all equal. You know, I'm, I'm your pastor, but I'm your brethren. I'm your brother. Don't come and call me master. I'm not your master. The only master you should be calling master is Christ. It says that even Christ says, and all, and all ye are brethren. This is important. This is, this is what's going to prevent uh, religious leaders, church leaders, from being puffed up by remembering, hey, I'm just a brother in Christ. You know, I'm just here to serve the brethren. You know, I'm here with an important position that God has given me, but the only master, the only one deserving to be called master, of course, is Jesus Christ. And then verse number nine, and call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Again, the Roman Catholics, what do they like to be called? Father. Father. They don't even get married. They're not allowed to have kids. They, don't, they can't have kids. And they won't be called father. <laughs> What in the world? <laughs> you know, they want to be called father. Now, look, this is some people get this wrong and say, well, can I not call my earthly father father? No, of course, the context is important here. The context is the religious leaders. The spiritual titles you give to religious leaders, don't call them father. Because, of course, we have one father. That's God the Father, which is in heaven. And verse number 10. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you, you shall be, uh, sorry, among you shall be your servants. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So Jesus Christ here teaches about humility. And what's the opposite of humility? Pride. Basically he's saying these Pharisees, they're full of pride. They're puffed up. You know, and again, if you ever take a position of leadership in a church, you, got, you can't be someone of pride. Now, are, am I going to say you're never going to have pride? We, we all have pride. We all have an ego. We don't like being told we're wrong. We don't like that. You know, usually the flesh gets in the way. But we need to be people that are able to put that aside and humble ourselves. And again, when I stand here preaching the word of God, yes, I have the authority in the church, but I do that as a servant. You know, the reason I go and study the word of God is not to show off. I don't want you guys to think I'm great. You know, what I want you to do is just appreciate the Word of God and know when I put a lot of study, when I preach with my heart, you guys know Pastor Kevin's doing this because he loves us. Pastor Kevin's doing this because he's trying to serve us the Word of God. He's serving us as a servant to the brethren. And that's the position of leadership in a church, for you to be a servant to the brethren, not for you to show off. The only person I'm going to be boasting about is Jesus Christ. You know, and, and him crucified. So this is lessons of humility. The Bible said there in verse 12, whosoever shall exalt themselves, himself shall be abased. 
And of course that happens. Many pastors, many preachers lift themselves up with pride and then you find out some horrible truth. Something comes out and now they're being abased by God. Okay? They lifted themselves up and God is the one that brought them down. Okay? And it says, He that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So I'm going to do the best I can to humble myself. Hopefully the Lord will exalt me in His due time. Wherever that is. You know, it doesn't matter. As long as it's the Lord doing it, I don't want to be doing it myself. Verse number 13. And this is the first woe. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. He says, look, you're preventing people from going into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, what? They're preaching a false gospel. They're preaching a gospel of works of keeping the Old Testament laws. Okay? They're rejecting Christ. It's Christ the only way you can be saved. They're rejecting Him. He says, look, you're turning people against uh, the King of Heaven. He says, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer or allow ye them that are entering to go in. So there are people that want to go in. They want to know what must I do to be saved. And these Pharisees are preventing them from knowing the truth. There are people coming to know Christ. Oh, Jesus is at the temple. I want to go there and listen to him preach. I want to see what he says. The Pharisees, no, no, no. He's a false prophet. You know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Hey, they're preventing people from knowing the truth. All right. Now, you know, I, I always tie in soul winning somewhere. And this is where I'm going to tie it in. Okay. Because there are, if you're not soul winning, if New Life Baptist Church is not soul winning, I tell you who's soul winning, the Mormons. Okay, the Jehovah Witnesses. Okay, they're the ones going out giving their false gospel. Okay, and they're causing people to be shut up from the kingdom of heaven. I mean, how, have you ever knocked on the door of a full-blown JW or a Mormon? They're almost impossible to get saved. Okay, they're so hardened against the, the, the scriptures. They're so hardened against the gospel of Christ. You know, they, they've completely swallowed the false teaching. And what you soon see here is, oh, we'll cover it soon in verse 15. Let's just keep reading. Let's keep reading. Verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Look, is this saying you've got a chance to be saved? You still have a chance. As long as you're breathing, Pharisees, you know, just to, to the last moment before you die, you can still be saved. Now, Jesus says here, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Now, you're going to receive it. There's no, there's, it's too late for you. You start to see this as, as we put, uh, go through the chapter, okay? But it says here that they devour widows' houses. Now, I don't fully understand this. I don't know what kind of authority the scribes and the Pharisees had over widows. My takeaway on this is, is potentially because widows obviously don't have a husband. They don't have that male leadership. Perhaps they've entrusted the religious leaders, the Pharisees, entrusted them with their property. I, that's, what, that's how I see it. They probably entrusted these religious leaders with their property. Says, you look after me. I'm a widow. I don't have a husband. Can you please help me out? And these guys, yep, we'll do it. And then they take it under them completely take away the property for themselves and leave these widows without homes. And of course, Jesus Christ says they also make long prayers. You know, that they like to be seen as holy, making long, fancy prayers. And he says, you receive the greater damnation. Okay, verse number 15. Now look at this. Woe unto you, the third woe. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte. What that means is you, you go to all lengths to convert one to your faith, to, to you convert one to your religion. You go land and see, you, you do everything you can to have a convert for yourself. But then it says, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. He tells, look, to the Pharisees, you're already a child of hell. And these converts that you're making, they're twofold more the child of hell. Now this is, I'll show you soon, this is a reprobate, okay? Keep your finger there and turn to the book of Jude. Jude verse 11, the book of Jude. Now if you're familiar with the book of Jude, the book of Jude is about false prophets, false teachers, you know, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, okay? The, if you want to know what a false prophet's like, just read the book of Jude. It will give you a lot of information about it. But let's go to Jude verse 11. Remember, they make their proselytes or their converts, it said, twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Twofold more. What is that about? Look at Jude 11. 
And remember how Jesus said to them, woe unto you. Now look how Jude 11 starts off. Woe unto them. Okay. For they have gone in the way of Cain. Remember Cain killed Abel. He tried to be saved by his works. He brought his offering of works. Hey, this guy was unsaved. This guy had a false religion. But then it says, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. So they're after money and perished in the gainsaying of Cory. If you remember the story about Cory, he was basically the earth opened up, swallowed them whole, and they went physically down into hell. Okay, so th these are people that are damned. But verse number 12, these are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Look, they want to feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds are they without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Hey, these false prophets, twofold more the child of, of hell, and twice dead. Okay, this is the same teaching being taught here. Now, this is what I want you to understand. Your regular unbeliever out there, your regular unsaved person, or when you were unsaved, okay, you were dead spiritually, okay? Every child that's born into the world is alive spiritually. If you read, look, read Romans 7, this will make, make sense to you. But when they understand their sinful condition, when you understand that you've broken the laws of God, you die spiritually, okay? You're once dead is what I'm saying. You're once dead, okay? You die once spiritually. But of course, you're going about life in your physical body, all right? Now, if you were twice dead, let's say you were dead spiritually, and then you die physically, where are you going to be? You're going to be in hell. You're going to be definitely in hell, okay? This is why it's important for you to be born again, okay? The new spirit must be born again, so when this old flesh dies, the living spirit will go and be with the Father, and one day God will give us the new resurrected bodies, okay? So he's saying, look, these guys, they're walking the earth. They're not physically dead, but they're already twice dead. They're already damned. Like, they're not physically in hell, but as far as God's concerned, they're in hell. As far as God is concerned, they're damned. Uh, woe is upon them, and there's no chance for them. They're not going to make it anymore. They're twice gone, twice dead. And that's what these Pharisees are doing by their teaching, their teaching of works, their teaching of being anti-Christ, okay? Turning people against Christ is causing the, their converts to be twice dead. You know, twice the child of hell, as it said in Matthew 23. Go back to Matthew 23 now. Matthew 23, I hope you can see that. If you have any questions, of course, you know, you can always ask me, okay? But as we get toward the end of the chapter, you'll see clearer. You'll see more and more of the clarity of these people being reprobate. Verse number 16. Verse number 16. The Bible says, Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Now, before I keep reading, I'll just explain what this means. It might go over your head a little bit. But the Pharisees were teaching, if you make a promise, if you swear, you know, I sw not, not swear like cussing, but like swear like you make an oath, you make a promise to God about something. He says, if you made the promise by the temple, and if you say, well, you know, God, I promise, you know, by this temple that I will do this for you. They're saying that it is nothing in verse 16. Like if you break that promise, it's okay. But then they say what they're teaching is, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. So if you say, God, by the gold of this temple, I promise to do X, Y, and Z, then you have to keep it. Okay. So what they're saying is the gold essentially is more important than the temple. Okay, now what, now what does Jesus say? You, you can just see, I mean, these are just silly teachings, right? You can just see. But look at verse 17. What does Jesus say about their teaching? Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold? Okay, what's more important? Like, if you just had gold, yes, it's valuable. But if, you just, if I just got a lump of gold, bang there, yes, it's valuable. But what's more important, the gold or the temple, which is the house of God, you know, in, in accordance to the Old Testament? Now, the house of God in the New Testament is the local congregation. It's the church. You know, what would be more important, you think, the gold or the church? Of course, church is more important than money. Church is more important than, than wealth, okay? But what makes the gold in the temple important is the fact that it's in the temple. It's being used for temple use. It's being used for worship and service of the Lord. 
So they've got their, their, their priorities are mixed up and God, uh, Jesus is just showing them their hypocrisy, just showing them their error. So if that makes sense, you'll keep reading here. Verse number 17, uh, verse 18, sorry, 18. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, now the altar is where they would offer sacrifices, remember that? Swear by the altar, uh, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. So if you made an oath by the altar, they're saying, well, if you break it, it's nothing. But if you swear by the gift, the, the, the sacrifice that's on the altar, well, now you've got to keep it. Okay? And again, it's the same idea. You know, a sacrifice, you know, a, a, let's say a, an animal, let's say a, a sacrifice of, an, you know, of a creature, the shin of blood, it, you can do that anywhere. It's, it's not important. Where it is important in the sight of God in the Old Testament is that it would be offered upon the altar. So it's the altar that gave the sacrifice importance. Okay, and Jesus Christ is teaching them this. And I'll, and I'll, I'll take a practical lesson for us very soon. But then verse 19, verse 19, Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and by all things thereon. Okay, so gold and sacrifice is meaningless without it being in its proper place when it comes to worshiping the Lord. Okay, now I know this is Old Testament teaching, okay, Old Testament teaching, but uh, let's have a look, uh, sorry, let, let's, let's read verse 21, let's read verse 21, verse 22, verse 21, and whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein, and he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. So Jesus is basically saying, regardless of where you, what you swear on, you know, you've got to keep, you've got to keep that. Like, you know, if you make an oath, you make a promise, you, you swear to do something, you know, especially before the Lord, you ought to be someone that carries it out regardless of what you swear it on, okay, is what he's saying. But you say, well, is that what we should do? Should we go around swearing and making promises and oaths, you know, to the Lord, you know, like the, you know, the, you know, the, uh, Nazarites, you know, of, of the past, like Samson, you know, where he would, you know, swear an oath basically to not cut his hair, not to eat grapes and, and not to eat honey and do all these things because he was called to be a judge for the Lord. You know, should we be, should we be make, swearing things? Should we be doing that? Well, if you can go back to Matthew 5, please. Matthew 5, we already covered this before, but just to remind ourselves, Matthew 5 verse 33, let's just see, because we saw basically what the Pharisees are teaching. But we want to see what Christ teaches about swearing an oath, okay? Matthew 5.33. Matthew 5.33. Again, ye have heard it, ye, sorry, ye have heard that it had been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. Let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. So what Jesus teaches is basically don't swear at all. Don't make oaths. Don't make promises. Let your conversation be yea, yea, nay, nay. You know, if someone comes and asks you to do something and you can do it, yes, I can definitely do this, yea. All right. And if you can't do it, nay, that's how that's how Jesus says we ought to be. But we shouldn't make an oath. Say, you know, brother, you know, Pastor Kevin, can you do this for me? I know I can't or it's going to be very difficult. Yep, I'll do it. You know, I, I promise to do that. Hey, that would be wrong of me because I don't really know if I'm able to accomplish that or do that. OK, so basically, you know, the teaching of Jesus is that if we're confident we can do it. Yes. If you're not confident, just say no. Learn to say no is what Jesus is teaching. You know, don't make these these vain oaths that you can't keep. So that's the teaching of Christ. I just wanted to show you the comparison of Christ's teaching with the teaching of the Pharisees. Now, this is also why we don't have altar calls in the church. Do you guys know what altar calls are? If you've been to uh, churches in the past, maybe some other Baptist churches, what sometimes happens, a lot of pastors find success if they can get people to come to the front and pray and confess and commit and make oaths. All right? This is why they call it the altar call, right? And, and in order to do that, they'll preach very emotionally driven messages. You know, really just want to get to your heart, brother. Just want to you know, get you under conviction. If I get you under enough conviction, with enough emotion, maybe you'll come to the front here and, and commit to the Lord or you know, give yourself to the Lord or something like that. Look, 
I don't do this in, this in this church. And I don't even believe it's biblical. Okay, I don't believe it's biblical to do that. They call this an altar call. Okay, come into the front. There you go, you can't, Pastor Kevin, you're losing your mind. Take your Bible and turn to Hebrews 13, please. Hebrews 13. First of all, lesson number one, Jesus says, don't make offs. Okay, and that's what the altar call usually is. Someone will come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve you for the rest of my life. I'm, gonna, I'm, going to, I'm going to take on full-time ministry. You know, I feel like you're calling me to do that, and Lord, I'm, that's what I'm going to do. People make those promises, that people make those oaths, and oh, so many people don't keep them. Okay, <laughs> and that's what it is. It's the altar call. And we already saw that, Je- point number one, Jesus says, don't do it. Let your conversation be yay, yay, nay, nay, okay? Point number two, turn to Hebrews 13, verse 10. I think you guys turned there already. Hebrews 13, verse 10. And if you know the book of Hebrews, it's a, it's a very important book. You know, it clarifies the differences with the Old Testament practices and the New Testament. And in this chapter, you know, Paul is, exp- I believe it's Paul that writes the book of Hebrews, is explaining the Old Testament altar versus the New Testament altar. And he says here in verse 10, we have an altar. Hey, New Testament Christians, you have an altar, okay? Is that the altar call here? You know, is it come here, guys, and, and come and, and, and make your commitments to the Lord? Is that the altar? No, it says, you have an altar, we have an altar, and then uh, whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. Because, of course, if you know that how things operated under the Old Testament, the sacrifices that were put on the altar, you know, they would then be taken by the Levites and be eaten, that would be their food. You know, that would be the food that would be given to the tribe of, of, of Levi as well. And so he says, look, this is an altar where they don't eat of. It's not a place where you come and, and, and uh, give your sacrifices and eat of the food. And then it says in uh, verse number 11, For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. So it gives us this illustration that once the sacrifice was over, they would take all the leftovers of the animal, the guts, the fat, whatever would be left that wouldn't be eaten, they would take that outside of the camp and burn it to a crisp. Totally burn it, you know, outside of the camp. Wherefore, verse 12, wherefore Jesus also, so Jesus also did the same thing, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. So just like that Old Testament uh, sacrifice that would be burnt to a crisp outside the camp. The Bible says that Jesus suffered without the gates. Hey, he suffered outside the gates of Jerusalem. Hey, he was whipped. He was tried in Jerusalem. But then when he was crucified, he was taken outside of the gates of Jerusalem. That's what it's saying here. Without the gate or outside of the gate. Verse 13. And basically, look, before I read verse 13, that's our altar. Okay, when he was taken outside of the gate and he was crucified on the cross... That's our altar. That's our sacrifice. Okay, so if you say, man, are you going to have an altar call in the church? Well, the altar is salvation because you better apply that sacrifice that God gave us. You better believe in the Lord Jesus Christ on the shedding of blood because that's your altar. That's where you're meant to, uh, you know, commit yourself to because you're placing your faith there on Jesus Christ. And verse 13 says, let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Hey, what is now, now that we've accepted the sacrifice of God, we've placed our, our faith upon the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. What's our sacrifice? What did it say there? It said uh, to do good commun- and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Sorry, it also said there in verse 15, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Hey, when we come to church and we sing the praise of God, when we give thanks to God, that's our sacrifice back to God. That's our altar because we're looking at what he did for us and we're thanking the Lord for what he's done for us. That's our sacrifice, okay? Not you coming and making some emotional decision. That's not going to help you in life. What's going to help you in life, what God appreciates, the sacrifice he wants from you is his praise and his worship. Thanksgiving to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now turn to Exodus chapter 20, please. Exodus chapter 20. Last point, last point. Point number one, Jesus says don't make oaths. Point number two, is that our altar is the, is the cross. 
not this bench or, or whatever it is, you know, in front of a lot of churches. But point number three, Exodus chapter 20, verse 25. Exodus chapter 20, verse 25. Because the altar of the Old Testament, there were certain instructions given about how it should be built. And in Exodus chapter 20, verse 25, it says, And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it on hewn stone, for if thou, if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar. He says, look, when you make an altar, yes, make sure it's of hewn stone, but also um, don't make any steps. Don't make any steps, okay? You know why? Because it says, look, it said there in verse number 25, um, for if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Okay, they were meant to just take stones, of, you know, and, and just place them on top of each other, and that's how they made the altar. But if they brought their tools to make it all nice and perfect, it's been polluted. Why? Because that's a picture of works salvation. You're bringing your labor, you're bringing your works to it, okay? And if you put steps on the altar, you know, you're making that effort to climb the steps. Salvation is not by your efforts. It's not by you working, okay? Or by making steps. And here's the weird thing about it, is that many churches that have their altar calls, it's on a platform, it's on a step, or maybe several steps. And they say, come to the altar. And they come and there are several steps. Look, Jesus said the altar is to have no steps. Okay? So look, the reason we don't do altar calls here, those three reasons. Jesus says, don't make oaths. Okay, number two, we have an altar, that's the cross. And number three, the altar that's been done in many churches today is contrary to how God wanted an altar to be in the first place. All right? So there's a lot of traditions of men that our churches need to do away with. We need to get back to biblical practices. Back to Matthew 23, please. Matthew 23, verse 33. That's uh, 23. Matthew 23, 23. Matthew 23, 23. If you have any questions about that, please ask me, okay? Because that's obviously not very popular teaching, okay? But that's just how it is. Matthew 23, 23. Matthew 23, 23. Jesus says to them once again, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anus, anus and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye have done, and not leave the other undone. So the, the Pharisees are doing something right, okay? They're given their tithe, okay? They're even given their tithe of the small herbs, the little mint and cumin, the things that they're growing in the garden. They're doing the right thing. They're given a tithe of that. But Jesus says, look, you've omitted the weightier matters of the law. You're not doing the more important things, you know? And what are they? He said here, uh, judgment, mercy, and faith. Hey, they had poor judgment. Okay, they would do things and they wouldn't do things in accordance to God's standard. Mercy. They didn't have mercy for those that did not live up to their standards. We already saw that they devoured widows' houses. Okay, these guys had no mercy for the poor, for the unfortunate. And it says, and faith. And of course, they had no faith. Their faith was not, wasn't resting on Jesus Christ. Okay? Their faith was on their own performance. Their faith was on their own righteousness. Okay? They were missing the most important things, but they were doing the little things of the law, giving the tithe. Now, the tithe is important. Okay? It's not saying that the tithe is wrong. It's just saying that they should be doing both of those things. Okay? But, they're, but they're missing the most important things. Verse number 24. Verse number 24. Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Okay, like they, they find something in the Bible, just some little minor thing, and they argue, and say, what does that mean? We need to do it like that. You know, and, and they, they, it's like they, it's a, a gnat is a small little insect, right? And they end up swallowing a camel, meaning it takes up all their time, it takes up all their effort, they're probably so overwhelmed by that minor detail, and they're missing the things that are clear and obvious in the Scriptures. Let me just encourage you guys, as you read through your Bibles, that you're not always going to understand what it says, okay? There are certain chapters you're going to read, it's just going to go over your head. Don't, don't stress about it. Don't strain at the gnat, okay? Focus on the things as you read the Word of God. This is a living book. It's a living book. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, the Holy Ghost will help you understand. And if there's something you don't understand, maybe the Holy Spirit just doesn't want you to understand at this point in time. Maybe the Holy Spirit just wants you to learn some of the weightier things first. Maybe He wants you to understand the clearer things first, the foundational things first. And then when you have subsequent readings, then those other things will start to become clear to you. 
Okay, but don't don't strain at the gnat and swallow a camel. All right, verse number twenty-five. Woe unto you! I mean, how many woes are there? I'm losing count. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye make clean the outside of the cup and on the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside uh, of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Now, this is the idea of wolves in sheep's clothing. Hey, on the outside, they looked beautiful. On the outside, they look righteous. On the outside, they look like Christians, okay? And we need to be very careful, okay? Because we can have people in our church that appear very godly, very righteous on the outside, okay? I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Hey, if on the outside you're reflecting Christ, if on the outside you look holy and righteous, you're doing the best you can to serve the Lord, that's a great thing, okay? But there are people like that that are, have that, are basically dead on the inside, dead men's bones, okay? They, they believe salvation is outward reformation. If I can just clean up my life, if I can just be a good person, if I can just walk in the ways of the Lord, that outward reformation, they think that will make them right with God, okay? But salvation starts inside, Salvation starts by believing in your heart, okay? Salvation starts with the new man, the new spirit, walking in the spirit. And then, as you walk in the spirit, as you grow, as you mature, the outward will start to change as well, okay? The outward will start to change. Now, one thing um, that I, um, when I started the church in Queensland, I didn't, I wasn't wearing a tie, okay? I wasn't wearing a tie, I was kind of, pretty much the way I'm dressed, but I didn't have a tie on. And then I thought, no, because there's a lot of churches on the Sunshine Coast, that are very, you know, Pentecostal. They kind of look like the way I dressed, right? So I thought, no, no, I, I better put on, I'm going to put on my ties so I can differentiate myself, okay? And then I started to instruct all the men in the church, when you get up to preach, I want you to wear a tie as well, okay? But here's the thing, here's the thing. I didn't want people to put on a tie and a nice jacket, you know, and to appear righteous on the outside and be dirty on the inside. You know, and one thing that I instructed the men in my church was, when you do get ready to get up here and preach, when you put on your tie and you realize, hey, I look nice on the outside, you better go and make sure the inside's clean. If you have any unconfessed sin before the Lord, you better go sort that out, okay? So just as a reminder, when you put the outside clothes on, make sure that the inside is clean. That's more important, okay? That the inside is clean and then that will come out on the outside, all right? So um, verse number 29, verse number 29. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Because ye build, the, uh, sorry, ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. Okay, so these Pharisees, one thing they would do is they would uh, build tombs for the prophets. Of the righteous people in the, in the Bible, they would look after the tombs. You know, they would clean it. They would put flowers. You know, they make it look pretty, right? And, and they're trying to uphold the men in the past and, and look up to them, as it were, okay? They're doing that. They're looking after the, their tombs. And then in verse 30, Jesus says, and say, what do they say once they look, look, clean up the tombs and fix them all up? And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. So these Pharisees are basically saying, hey, we wouldn't have put these prophets to death if we lived in the days of our father. But hey, if you remember, as we re read through the previous chapters, these guys were plotting to put Jesus to death. Okay, like they're saying we're not like our fathers, but they're trying to put the Messiah to death, they're trying to put God to death. I mean, they're even worse. They're worse than their fathers. Verse 31, Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that if ye are the children of them which killeth the prophets, fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Look at this. Ye serp Look at this. If these, these guys are reprobates. Get this in verse number 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Hey, that's a rhetorical question. He's saying you're not going to escape the damnation of hell. Okay, you're damned to hell is what he's saying. He's not saying, hey, you still have a chance. I'm still here. You can still believe in me. Okay, no, how are you going to escape the damnation? You're not going to escape the damnation is what, is what he's saying. Yeah. Okay, you're not going to escape. These guys are damned to hell. Okay, and if you want further proof, oh, come on, are they real? Yes, look, 
They can't escape. <laughs> okay, there's no escape for them. Okay? Now, look, hypothetically, if they believed on Christ, yes, of course they'd be saved. Okay? But the thing about a reprobate, again, remember, they have rejected Christ. Okay? It's not that they've rejected the gospel once. They've just, they're wicked. They've got into a part where God's just done with them and God's rejected them and they can't believe. Okay? It's not that if they believe, they can't be saved. They can't even believe. That's why they can't even believe on Christ. They have God face to face. They have the Messiah face to face with them and they can't see it. They can't see it. Okay? Verse 34. Verse 34. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify. And of course, as we get to the book of Acts and we see the works of the, of the apostles, some of them were put to death by the leaders, right? I mean, even, even um, Paul, right, consented to the death of Stephen. Remember that? And, uh, you know, these guys were persecuting the early church. And indeed, they're saying we wouldn't be like our fathers, but then they are the ones persecuting the New Testament church. Okay, and Jesus basically prophesying of that happening. Uh, and verse 34 again, sorry, I didn't read all of it, I think. And some of them you shall scourge in, us in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. That upon you, look, upon you, Pharisees, may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel, Look, Abel, all the way in the book of Genesis, Abel the first, um, not the firstborn, the secondborn of Adam and Eve, okay? Unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. So basically Jesus says, look, all the prophets from A to Z, from Abel to Z, all of them, okay? You, that's going to come upon you. Now they didn't go and kill these prophets. They're not the ones, it was their fathers. But he's saying, because you rejected me, because you're, you're the children of your fathers, the same judgment will fall upon them as though they were the ones that had killed these righteous prophets. From Abel to Zacharias. Look at verse 36. Verily I say unto you. Look, look, do we believe the words of Jesus or not? Look, it says, Verily I say unto you, Truly, all these things shall come upon this generation. Okay? They're going to face the judgment of the, 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 the murder of the prophets of the past. From Abel all the way to Zacharias upon this generation. That generation of pharisaical, Christ-rejecting Jews, they were done. They're not going to escape the damnation of hell. And they're going to face the full brunt of the wrath of God. Okay? Hey, they're still walking the earth. They're reprobates. Okay? This is a true doctrine. That you can be walking the earth and you've been rejected by God. There's no chance for you. You're just as well as damned. You know, there's, there's no chance for those people. All right? Jesus says, verily, all these things shall come upon this generation. It's not like maybe, but if you get saved, no, they're not, they're not going to get saved. Okay? They're done. They're done. All right? Verse number 37. Verse 37. Now, here's the thing. Of course, Jesus did come for the whole earth. Of course, Jesus even died for the sins of these Pharisees. Okay, and this is where you see the compassion of the Lord. Okay, because do you think truly God wants people to go to hell? Of course not. Okay, that's why Christ came. Okay, the love of God came, and you can see the heart of Jesus. Once He's rebuked them, once He's just told them, like, you're damned, you're reprobate, you're not going to escape hell, He says this about Him, verse 37 O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. So you see, Jesus, he made an effort. You know, he wanted to be. He says, how often? He says he tried over and over again as a mother hen to bring the little chickens under her wings. He tried to be loving, compassionate. He tried to give them time. He tried to be patient with them. He says, but ye would not. Okay, ye would not. You know, verse 38, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And the house, he, he's referring to Jerusalem in verse 37, because if you know your history, in 70 AD, Jerusalem would be burnt, the temple would be destroyed, and Jesus is basically prophesying of roughly 40 years after, after this, what's going to happen to Jerusalem. It be totally wiped out. You know, that great temple they rejoice in, totally destroyed, the city will be burnt up to a crisp. And then verse number 39, for I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Okay? 
So just to give you the time in here, this is about two days before he's crucified. Jesus Christ is crucified. He says, look, you're not going to see me anymore, basically, he says to these Pharisees. Till you shall say, now this is an interesting thing. Till you say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. When you say those words, then you'll see me. That's what he's saying. Hey, what's that about? What's that about? Well, if you remember, when he came into Jerusalem riding on the donkey, what were all, the, all his believers saying? They were saying exactly that, right? They were saying, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, right? They were saying, Hosanna to the highest. They were saying those exact words as a believer, as believers. But here's the thing. Even non-believers, even those rejected, even those in hell, one day are going to acknowledge that Jesus Christ came in, in the name of the Lord, that Jesus Christ is Lord. We'll end on this. Please take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9. Because you might be wondering, is he saying that, well, he's just damned them to hell. Is he saying now, well, maybe you will get saved if you say, blessed be, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. No, go to Philippians 2 verse 9. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9. The Bible says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, speaking of Jesus, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, so the Bible tells us in verse 10, every, per every creature in heaven every creature in the earth and everything under the earth what's under the earth hell okay everyone that's been damned every reprobate will bow their knee one day and just say jesus christ is lord they're just going to have to accept it they're just going to put you know but instead of accept you know saying it enjoy man it's going to be in torment and it's going to be it's going to be a disaster for them to finally acknowledge that's who jesus christ was we rejected this him the whole time we're doomed forever you know we're, we're a child of hell forever and uh, so I hope that's given you an interesting take of Jesus Christ. These are the verses that a lot of people don't want to preach on. Okay, they like to preach on Christ's compassion and his healing and his great teachings like the Sermon on the Mount. But when it comes to his harsh words against the false leaders, a lot of people just like to avoid that. Okay, because hey, that's, that's, that's the Jesus Christ that saved us. That's the Jesus Christ of the Bible to know what he's like. Yes, great love but also great vengeance on those that would reject him. And especially those that teach false gospels, especially those that lead others to hell. You know? And of course, you can understand then why they become reprobate. How, how long can you go rejecting Christ? You know? At some point, God's going to give up on you. you know? and, and, and the teaching here, guys, is if there's anyone here that is not saved, you say, I don't know if I'm saved, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. Look, I don't want you to become reprobate, you know, either on this earth or even in hell. You know, your, your time is limited. You don't know when that might be. You know, you better make a decision and place your faith on Christ. You know, say today, blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. I want you saying that today about Christ, then when you're in hell. Okay, so let's leave it there and let's pray.